All right. So let's get started. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, tonight we are in Judges 6 through 8. We'll start with a prayer first. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for tonight that we can come to to the Wednesday Bible study uh, to study your word. May you just, just help us to just rest our hearts, rest our minds as we get into your word, Lord. May you just speak to us and may you just bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You know, last week we stopped at um, chapter 5. And you remember that was um, the song of Deborah. And Deborah and Barak, they had um, victory over uh, their enemies. And and the last part of the last verse of chapter 5 uh, was, um, so the land had rest for 40 years, which is good. They had peace. But there, but, uh, but at this time, the Israelites had, you know, they had a, an issue with, with just obeying the Lord. And then when they obeyed the Lord, the Lord blessed them. But what happens is after that, they would forget and then they would go against what the Lord tells them to do. And then, then they would just fall into the trap again where, where they, where they get, um, the enemies of Israel would, um, you know, would take over and they become enslaved. And then they would start the cycle again where they cry out to the Lord. So it's almost like a, um, a psych, a cyclical thing. So let's start with chapter six, uh, verse one. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites. The children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. So it was whenever Israel had sown, sown, Midianites would come up. Also the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. Then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor donkey, for they would come up with their livestock and their tents coming in as numerous as locusts. Both they and their camels were without number, and they would enter the land to destroy it. So this thing about how Israel, the people of Israel would just follow, you know, they, when they obey the Lord, the Lord would watch over them. But when they didn't do it, and, you know, then bad things starts to happen. And this time, after 40 years of rest, they, uh, the children of Israel, did evil in the sight of, sight of the Lord again. And these Midianites, God used these guys to basically as a, a, a wooden spoon to spank Israel. And sometimes the Lord would do that, use different people, different circumstances to get us to start thinking about how do we, you know, what we're doing and how do we get back to him. And there are times God would use Israel as the wooden spoon for others too. And these Midianites, if you guys um, remember, these guys are, are nomads. They would go from place to place. They really didn't build any cities. And the interesting, interesting thing about the Midianites are that they, they were the first one in history to use camels in war. So they knew, they know how to ride camels. They know how to use them as, um, as their quote unquote vehicles for war. And it's pretty fierce because when the enemies of the Midianites would see these guys on top of these camels and they're riding really fast and they're, they're, they're fighting, Everybody would be very scared. And actually, the Midianites back then, um, for this army, they had 135,000 men minimum at that time fighting. Who knew, who knew how to use bows and, 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 and arrows and, and all that? And they were like locusts. They were like locusts that covered the earth for, um, as far as Israel is concerned. And then also the, the other enemies, Amalekites. These Amalekites were also nomadic. So Israel was 
fighting these guys. And these guys would come over and take over the produce that the Israelites would, would have sown. They take all their food. They take all their sheep. And, and in the end, the Israelites had nothing. They had no sustenance. So they're crying out to the Lord. Okay. And then verse 6, So the Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. And it came to pass, when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel, who said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who oppressed you and drove drove them out before you and gave you their land. Also I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. You know, God is a very clear, is very merciful God, a loving God, but he's also clear in his message. And his message is, hey, listen to what I say. And and, and then, you know, go well. And, you know, our Lord never tells us that we're going to have you know, the perfect life here on earth. He never said that, but he said he's going to be with us. He will go with us, and he will just uh, live life uh, as he guides us because he has the best plan. But these guys, these guys didn't listen to God. They did, well, they did exactly sometimes the opposite of what the Lord wants them to do. In fact, every time um, when one of the judges dies, they would just go immediately, go back into sin. And that's why in this section of Judges, um, there's 13 times they would do this. And God sent a prophet to tell these guys when they're crying out to him, said, hey, you guys, you guys did not obey my voice. You didn't obey my word. And there are times that we would think that, you know, why, why, are, why are the Israelites like this? How come they just didn't learn their lessons? But then you think about us, about you and me. And I think God sometimes would say, uh, John, how come you didn't learn your lesson? And I get that because we're, we're human and sometimes we just fall. And these guys, so I'm not really quick to judge these guys because I see myself doing that also, and I believe you guys do too. Okay, verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth or the oak tree, which was in Ophrah, which belongs to Joash the Abizrite, uh, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. You know, usually... Or when they thresh wheat, you know, usually it's done on top of the mountain or on top of the hill where they throw this wheat out and the wind would um, just blow the chaff away and the, the grain would just fall back down and they, that's how they do it. But this time, Gideon was, um, was doing this. In fact, on the, it's, it's on the bottom of the hill and it's where the wine press is in order to do what? In order to hide to hide it from the Midianites. So he was hiding because he didn't want to be out in the open where the Midianites would come and get it. Verse 12, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty men of valor. You know, we talked about this before. When it says in the Old Testament, whenever they say the angel of the Lord in capital L-O-R-D, it's usually um, theologians and a lot of theologians would, would say that this is a Christophany is as you know, Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, and that means he existed before the New Testament. And with that said, the angel of the Lord would be the second person of the Trinity. Um, and I'll I'll tell you, um, there's a certain section here that why I also believe this is um, is Jesus of the Old Testament. Um, it's interesting that the angel of the Lord says, tells Gideon, who's hiding, says, 
The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And I think about that. I think about how God sees people, sees you and me in a different light. Sometimes we're hiding. Sometimes we don't feel like, you know, I, I, I really don't know what to do. I, and, and I'm not sure, you know, what I should be doing or who I am. But God sees us as a person that he fearfully and wonderfully made. He knew us while we were in our mother's womb. And he, he loves us. He has a good plan for each one. So he sees Gideon as a mighty man of valor while he's hiding. And sometimes we're wondering, Lord, what's your plan for my, my life? But the Lord sees us in, in a role where he, in his sovereign plan, he sees us in that role already. He, he has a good plan for each one of our lives. But how we respond, how we act, are we willing to listen to his voice? That'll determine what's going to happen. But over all of this, it's in his sovereign plan, and he sees Gideon as a mighty man. But Gideon, this is how he answered, verse 13. Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our father told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Good question. I mean, Gideon said, well, if God's with us, why are we suffering under the Midianites? And, and where are all the miracles that, you know, our, our forefathers, you know, you know, our fathers before oh, told us about all the miracles that, that God did for them? What happened to that? And why am I hiding here, scared to death, um, and, 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 and threshing wheat in the wine press? Good questions, right? Then verse 14. And the Lord turned to him. So that's why I said the angel of the Lord is, is the Christophany, is, is Jesus, second person of the Trinity. Because here, then the Lord, Jehovah, this is L-O-R-D, whenever it has the capital, that's Jehovah, turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours that you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? And God just told him that, hey, you're gonna be, you're gonna be going out to save Israel. He totally just didn't even respond to where is it? He said, I'm telling you what to do. You're gonna go save Israel. Have I not sent you? Then verse 15, so he said to him, this is Gideon, oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Oh, Lord, I, how can I go? We're poor. We're the poorest of the poor. Manasseh, half tribe of Joseph. And, and he said he's the weakest in, uh, of the tribe of Manasseh. You know, God sometimes wants us to do something. But a lot of times, most of the time, we would say, we come up with excuses. Lord, I can't do this. You know why? And you list all the excuses. Moses did that. God wanted him to go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. God, Lord, I can't speak. I don't know how to talk. God told Moses, uh, Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah, God told Jeremiah to, to t t talk to, uh, to, to do what he wants. And Jeremiah said, um, if I remember correctly, Jeremiah said, I'm too young. And sometimes I think about this. I think about, Lord, are there times that I give excuses to you when you want me to do something? And you think about it, there are. This is part of, almost part of the nature of, of, of sinful man, where, Lord, I, I can't do that because of this excuse and that excuse. And then so's Gideon here. Gideon says, you know, I'm from a poor tribe. I'm from a poor family. I can't do this. And then verse 16, And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. You know, the, the most important thing we tend to forget is that 
God is with us. If God is with us, who can be against us? Is there anything too difficult for the Lord? And and we tend to forget that. And there are times that I tend to forget that. I come up with human excuses, but God here it says, "I will be with you." And when God says that, we need to take that to heart. Verse sixteen, and the Lord said to him, "Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man." Verse seventeen. Then he said to him, "If now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who talk to me. Do not depart from here, I pray, until I come back and bring." Out my offering and set it before you. So Gideon now wants to kind of test、um, the Lord, and he says, "Hey, hey, let, let me bring some offering over to you. Don't leave till I come back." And then,、um, verse nineteen.、Uh, the, then the Lord said, and he said, "I will wait until you come back." Verse nineteen. So Gideon went in and prepared a young goat and unleavened bread from the ephah of flour. The meat he put in a basket, and he put. Uh, the broth in a pot, and brought them out to him under the terebinth tree or the oak tree, and presented them. The angel of God said to him, "Take the meat and the unleavened bread, and lay them on this rock, and pour out the broth." And he did so. You know, this is this is almost like a、uh, peace offering. It's also like a burnt offering. The peace offering is the unleavened bread, where you have peace with the Lord. You have a meal. With the Lord, and then the burnt offering for sin is the meat, you know, the the, the goat meat, and then、um, they brought the water out, which is the drink offering. So, actually, Gideon was worshiping the Lord, was having communion with the Lord, and it's kind of cool that that when we say the angel of God is the second person of the Trinity. Uh, where、um, a Christophany、um, that in the New Testament we have communion with the Lord too.、Uh, verse twenty-one. Then the angel of the Lord put out the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread, and fire rose out of the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread, and the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Kind of cool. I mean, a staff and just kind of burn up the meat, and then all of a sudden the angel Lord disappeared.、Um, I th- I think that kind of confirmed to Gideon、um, who he's talking to, right? Verse twenty-two. And now Gideon perceived it that he was the angel of the Lord, capital L O R D. So Gideon said, "Alas, Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face." Then the Lord said to him, "Peace be with you." Do not fear; you shall not die. Remember, no one can see God face to face, but when God became man, you know we see Jesus, and and He dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, and here the angel of the Lord, and again Christophany, and back in Moses' day, you you know God wouldn't allow him to see him face to face. You only see the the foreshad the shadow. Of, of um, of the Lord, and here he says, "Oh no, I I saw God face to face, angel of the, angel of God." But then the Lord said to him, "Do not fear; you're not going to die," which is good for Gideon. So Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, "The Lord is peace." To this day, it is still in Ophrah of the Abizrites. You know, Gideon was a very deep guy. He saw, you know, he he didn't take it for granted that the angel of God said,、uh, "The Lord is the Lord. Peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die." He, he God just called him to war, to go fight. And but then the Lord said, "Peace be with you." He saw beyond what he was supposed to do. He saw the peace that was going to come, and then he built an altar. And, and for worship, and he called it Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is peace. And sometimes I believe we need to do that too. When God tells us to do something, we know in the end, whatever we do, in the end, we're in heaven. We're gonna go to heaven, and we don't know when. 
or we don't know, you know, either the Lord comes back or we go first, but we're going to go to heaven, and he promises us peace. He promises us that the peace of God will be with you when we pray, when we just give everything to him. He promises us rest. He said, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You know, God is a God of peace. God is a God of rest. He wants each one of us to do that. But sometimes we just look at all the things that's ahead of us, in front of us, but we don't think about or meditate upon that God wants us to have that peace, it, even though everything else is a storm. And his peace surpasses all human understanding. So that's why uh, I think even for here, Gideon was looking beyond the war because he built an altar and called it the Lord is peace. And we have a God, we have a Jesus who is our peace. So whatever you guys are going through tonight, you need to think that God wants to give you peace. God wants to give you rest. We can rest in him. We can, we can cast all our burdens upon him. And he will give you rest. He will give you peace. Verse 25. Now it came to pass the same night that the Lord said to him, Take your father's young bull, the second bull of seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal, that your father has, and cut down the wooden image that is beside it. That wooden image is a the female goddess of these guys that had a it's the Astera, and it, 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 it's um basically they do a lot of crazy things. Um, it's a lot of promiscuity. They have prostitutes in the temple, and Baal is the the man form. So they had both. Um, he um the Lord told Gideon to 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 take these these idols down and the wooden image is the female Astra. Um and built an altar for the Lord your God on top of this rock in the proper arrangement and take the second bowl and burn, offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the image which you shall cut down. So they're going to use the wood of the idol Astra to, to use it as wood for to burn the uh, burnt offering. Uh, but burnt sacrifice. So verse 27, So Gideon took ten men from among his servants and did as the Lord had said to him. But because he feared his father's household and the men of the city, too much to do it by day, he did it by night. So this time period, all those guys there were, were idol worshippers. They are Baal worshippers, they are Asherah worshippers. So if he did it during the day, I mean, even his household they he believed they would have had a big fight. They would have been a big argument, probably very physical, and as we will read, maybe to the death. So he did it at night just to avoid all that. Verse 28, And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, there was the altar of Baal torn down, and the wooden image that was beside it cut down, and the second bowl was being offered on the altar which has had been built. So they had, they said to one another, who has done this thing? And when they had inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash has done this thing. Then the men of the city said to Joash, bring out your son that he may die because he has torn down the altar of Baal and because he has cut down the wooden image that was beside it. You see, these guys were all into their idol worship. They're willing to kill people for taking it down. So that's why Gideon didn't want to do this during the day. He did it at night. But you know, no matter how good one plan to do something, and even if it's at night, whatever you're planning is going to come out. <laughs> it's going to come out. And these guys asked, who did it? And, you know, it was Gideon and 10 other guys, but it came out. So, and even... These guys did it for the Lord, but most times when, when a lot of things happen at night, it's not for good things, right? And so a good lesson here is if you think you're, you're hiding, you're going to hide something, um, I hate to tell you this, but it's going to come out. Okay. Verse 31, 
but Joash said to all who stood against him, Would you plead for Baal? Would you save him? Let the one who would plead for him be put to death by morning. If he is God, let him plead for himself, because his altar has been torn down. Therefore on that day he called him Jerubbaal, uh, that's Gideon's new name, saying, Let Baal plead against him, because he has torn down his altar. So Joash apparently changed his mind about worshiping Baal, because you know, he, he said earlier that he was a worshiper, but now he's defending his son. He's saying that, well, if Baal is a god, why does he need you to defend him? You know, let him defend himself. And the truth is, Baal can't. I mean, he's just an idol. Astros can't. But there are times that you and I think that we have to defend our god. We don't. Our god, the living god, the living god who created the heavens and the earth, the one true God. He knows how to defend himself. We don't need to defend him. We just need to obey, uh, be in his word. We need to abide in him, obey him, and he knows how to defend himself. So we don't need to, you know, sometimes I see people that, oh, I need to defend the Lord. I need to argue this, argue that. We don't. And there are times I believe that we should just, any time that you think you need to defend the Lord or or do something that maybe um, talk to someone that about certain things. Sometimes we just need to pray and ask the Lord to, to, to do it. Because there are times that, and I believe for me and, and probably for you guys, God can do a lot better job than us in defending himself. Okay, let's see. And then verse 33. Um, then all the Midianites and the Malachites, the people of the east, gathered together, and they crossed over and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Then he blew the trumpet, and the Abirzites gathered behind him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also gathered behind him. He also sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, Naphtali, and they came up to meet them. So there's going to be a big fight. The Midianites, the Amalekites, they all gathered uh, near the Valley of Jezreel. And Valley of Jezreel is just part of the um, Megiddo. Um, and that's where uh, Eastern Megiddo. And that whole area is where the last war, um, when um, in Revelation, uh, the, when we have, um, when everyone gathers, uh, gathers together one last time. And when we go over Revelation, um, I don't know when, but that's a good question. One day we're going to go over Revelation. The last time I taught Revelation was in a few years ago. But once we go over the Revelation, we'll go over it's called the Battle of Armageddon. And this Battle of Armageddon is the last war. And this is where it'll take place. Um, yeah, 135,000 men. We're going to find out from the other side. And so Gideon got um, not all the Israelites, but the northern tribes to come and help. Verse 36, so Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, 37, Look, I shall put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor, and there is dew on the fleece only, and it is dry on all the ground. Then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand. As you have said, and it was so. When he arose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece together, he wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. So Gideon tested the Lord. It's called the fleece test. He just said, "God, if you're going to give me uh, give uh, help me defeat the enemies, if you're going to give the enemies to me, I'm going to put a fleece on the ground, and I and tomorrow morning I want." just the fleece to be wet and all the ground to be dry. And God did it. He wrung, you know, he got up in the morning and, and just kind of squeezed the fleece, bowl full of water came out and everything else was dry. But Gideon wasn't, he was, he still wasn't fully convinced, right? And I think sometimes our human nature does that to us. So he asked a second time, he said, do not be angry with me. 
But let me speak just once more. Let me test. I prayed just once more with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece and on all the ground. Let it be. Let there be dew. And the God did so that night. It was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew on all the ground. So he did it again, and God did exactly what Gideon asked for. The fleece was dry; everything else was wet. You know, um, in the Bible, they they all have this type of uh, test. They cast lots. They do all these things. And even in the New Testament, there's, there was one time where they have to cast lots to find the 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 apostle to replace Judas, and they cast lots, and 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 Matthias, I believe it's Matthias who came, who became the 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 twelfth apostle, and it's basically it's a way to find out if if it's God's will. And the issue is this, I mean. I think it, I know all of us want to know what is God's will. And if I'm, what I'm doing is part of God's will or if it's not part of God's will. And all of us have that question. So how do you know if it's God's will? How do you know that what you're doing today is part of God's plan? And the short answer is, it's really hard. But I, but we just go by what the Word of God tells us to do. Um, Word of God tells us to uh, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and the door will be opened to you. So we ask, we pray, we ask, we seek, we just ask the Lord if this is your will, Lord. And then we see what, what door God opens, you knock. And then you see which door, door God opens. If God opens a door, and usually if it's God's plan, He opens it widely. We don't even have to, we never have to push. We never have to force ourselves into a door. You knock, and then you see what God does. And that's what I do. You know, you ask, you pray, and then you see what the Lord does. And then also, one other thing is, is the peace of God with you? Is, is His peace? Do you have that peace where you're just anxious all the time and if you're anxious all the time then i would i would keep praying to see if this is really your will but you, you we have to remember we never have to force anything and sometimes we kind of think that you know this is i really want this i really want this and we kind of make it into lord this is my will but i want to say this is I want to make sure we do this, Lord. Will you help me? But it's really hit your own will. And in business, what I call this is you fell in love with your own program. You fell in love with something that you really want to do, but maybe it isn't God's will. And But you just fell in love with it and you just want to force it through. I know a lot of churches do that. They have certain things that certain people want to do, and they want to force it through, kind of ram it through. And they keep doing it, keep doing it. But then it doesn't, I mean, it never does anything. It doesn't grow. And people are really anxious about it. There are times that God wants to let something die. There are times. But we keep trying to do it on our own human will. And if there's no peace and God doesn't open the door, and you feel like you have to keep pushing it and keep trying to trying to prop it up and all that, then maybe the Lord doesn't want to that, for that thing to happen. So these are the things that we need to consider. Knowing God's will, doing God's will, we pray, and we see which door opens. We just knock. We don't even have to kick the door in or anything like that, and then see if there's peace of God that's part of you know, if you have that peace of God in you, in doing His will. Okay, so um, chapter 7, then uh, Jerubba, Jerubbaal, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the well of Harod, so that the camp of the Benjamites was on the north side of them by the hill of Moreh in a valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many. 
for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim the glory for itself against me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Now therefore proclaim the, in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. So they only had 32,000. The enemy has 135,000. And God said, you know, um, Gideon, you have too many people. And I'm sure Gideon was wondering, you know, these guys had a lot more. We only have 32. What are you talking about? But the Lord said, you know, tell, go tell everyone if, in front of everyone. said, if you're fearful and afraid, and afraid here means trembling, trembling. I mean, scared to death. Tell these guys they can go home. And Gideon, I'm just picturing Gideon, and he's listening to all this. He said, I'm sure he's going like, hmm? And then, what, 22,000 people went home, and there only 10,000 left. And Gideon's going, Lord, what am, what am I going to do now? 10,000 against 135,000, 13.5 times more than what you got. But you know, God is amazing. Because if, it's, if people are afraid and fearful, they're trembling, you really don't want them fighting with you. Because when you, when you get in the midst of the battle, and it's almost like even when you're working, when you're doing something really, really hard, when difficult time comes, you know who's with you and who's not with you. You know who's going to be working and fighting. But a lot of these people who are trembling and afraid, they're going to run. They're going to turn around and not going to fight. And that's going to influence everybody else. And so these guys going home is okay. So Gideon's got 10,000 left. But then verse 4, the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Huh? Bring them down to the water and I will test them uh, for you there. <laughs> Gideon's going, well, you don't have to test them. But uh, that's what I'm thinking. Then it will be that of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you, and whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. Verse 5, So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink, and the number of those who lap putting their hands to their mouth was 300 men. But all the rest of the people got down on their knees and drink water. Then the Lord said to Gideon, by the three hundred men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his own place. Think about this. God told Gideon, said, you still have too many. Because I don't want you guys to say that it's us, people, man. I did it. I saved Israel. God never shares his glory. And that's one thing about God we need to know. Anything that we do, any success that we have, I mean, think about it. He has his own breath. He holds our very breath in his own hand. Our lives are in his, uh, are in his hand. Any success that we have, we need to immediately give glory to the Lord. And so he took them down to 300. How did he do that? Anybody who gets down on their knees and just put their face in the water, you know, and you're not, you don't even care about what's around you, lapping like a dog and just kind of, you know, you're, you're down there and you're, it's no good. He said, let them go home, 9,700 of them. Only 300 took it up and drink like this. And then, you know, and it's, it's you're holding the cup, uh, cup the water, but you're still very aware of your surroundings. And he said, those are the guys that I want. And I want, and he made it so, the number so low that there's no way man can claim the glory. And it makes, um, it makes a lot of sense, but I'm sure Gideon was going, oh, oh boy, 300 against 135,000 men. Okay. Next, verse 8. So the people took provisions and their trumpets in their hands, and he sent away all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, and, uh, and retained those 300 men. Now the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. It happened on the same night that the Lord said to him, 
Arise, go down against the camp, for I have delivered it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, <laughs> go down to the camp with Pura, your servant, and you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hand shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. And he went to with Pura, his servant, to the outpost of the armed men who were in the camp. Verse 12. Now the Midianites and the Amal Amalekites, all the people of the east, were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts. Remember, there's 100,000, 135,000 of them. And the camels, and they were good with camels, were without number. I mean, that's a lot. As the sand by the seashore in multitude. I mean, that must have been a scary sight to see that the enemies were like the sand on the seashore. I mean, the people, the, um, the camels, like locusts. God is a very merciful and graceful God. You know, He gives us grace. Gideon was his man, and he told Gideon to fight. And Gideon did pretty much everything that God told him to do. But then he also knew Gideon is human. He said, you know, if you're still a little afraid, if you're still afraid, why don't you do this? Go down, take your servant with you, and go down to, the, to where the enemies are, and you're going to be strengthened by what you hear. I mean, what a wonderful God we have. He didn't have to do that. But he tells, and the good thing about Gideon is, you know, even though he's afraid, and he did go. He said, if you're afraid, he went. So he was afraid. But he listened to the Lord, and he went. And this is what happened. Verse 13, and when Gideon had come, there was a man telling a dream to his companion. So he's eavesdropping on the enemy. He said, I have had a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of the Midian, and they came to a tent and struck it so that it fell and overturned, and the tent collapsed. Then his companion answered and said, there, This is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. Into his hand God has del del delivered Midian and the whole camp. And verse 15, And so it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation that he worshipped. He returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. Can you imagine that? God is so amazing. He told Gideon, said, You know, if you're still afraid, why don't you go down there with your, with your servant Pura and then listen to these guys. And so he eavesdropped. He heard his name. He heard a dream. And he heard the interpretation. And his name was part of the interpretation that God was going, that the Midianites were going to be destroyed by Gideon himself and, and, and his, his, his whole, whole army of little army. I, I mean, that's only 300 people. But he heard his name. I mean, that's the, only God can do that, right? And then, um, so Gideon went back and was strengthened. Verse 16, Then he defi divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put a trumpet into every man's hand, and emptied, with empty pitchers and torches inside the pitchers. Verse 17, And he said to them, Look at me and do likewise. Watch, and when I come by to the edge of the camp, ye shall do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I shall, I and all who are with me, then you also blow the trumpets on every side of the whole camp and say, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the Middle watch. Middle watch, it starts at midnight. And they went there, and the middle whole middle watch is midnight to 3 a.m. But this is the beginning of the middle watch, so it's just a little past midnight, and everybody was prob probably in bed. Um, just as they had posted the watch, and they blew, they blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers. They held the torches in their left hand and the trumpets in their right hand for blowing. And they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And verse 21, And every man stood in his place or around the camp, and the whole army ran and cried out and fled. Verse 22, When the three hundred blew the trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp. And the army fled to Beth Arcacia toward Zerarah, as far as the border of Abal Mahola by Tabith. Amazing. Past midnight, they made all these noises, trumpet, broken jars, all that stuff, 
in three, all three sides, these guys, the enemy, was, they're all confused. They got up and started swinging in the darkness, and they're killing each other. They're running, and they can see a thing, and they're just swinging. God confused them. Verse 22, And the men of Israel gathered together from Naph Naphtali, Asher, and all Manasseh, and pursued the Midianites. Verse 24, Then Gideon sent messengers throughout all the mountains of Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and seize from them the watering places as far as Beth Barah and the Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered together and seized the watering places as far as Beth Barah and the Jordan. And they captured two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb. They killed Oreb at, at the rock of Oreb, and Zeb they killed at the winepress of Zeb. They pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon and on the other side of the Jordan. Wow. <clears throat> Gideon you know, defeated these guys. He was pursuing them. And then he asked the, the, the other tribes, Ephraim, um, in the mountain regions, and told them, to, hey, come on down and help us out too. We capture all the watering places so these guys don't escape. So they did. They captured two of the princes, killed them, beheaded them, and then, um, and now, um, and they they gave the gave the their heads to um, to Gideon, which is kind of weird, but I, I guess that's what they do back then. Um, ver, uh, chapter eight. Now the men of Ephraim said to him, "Why have you done this to us by not calling us when you went to fight with the Midianites?" And they repre reprimanded him sharply. These people from the tribe of Ephraim, they were troublemakers. These guys, I mean, they didn't want to fight. And these guys were very troublemakers, and we're going to see that in the next few chapters next week. They told Gideon, said, why didn't you tell us in the first place that you're going to fight and, and go fight these guys? But the, pro but the issue is if, if Gideon lost, they would have another tune. But Gideon actually had, he, he, he had character, he had wisdom, and this is how he responded to them. And he said to them, What have I done now in comparison with you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? God has delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb. And what was I able to do in comparison with you? Then their angers toward him subsided, and out when he said that, Gideon was smart. He doesn't want to argue. I mean, there are certain fights we don't want to fight. It's not worth it. And you're going to have troublemakers everywhere. But in life, certain fights you don't want to just, you don't want to just be dragged down. And these guys are troublemakers anyways. So Gideon was smart. He just said, you know, compared to you guys, I'm nothing. And he said, you know, even your gleaning of your grapes in Ephraim, Gleaning of grapes is after the first harvest, they already harvested everything. Gleaning is just taking the remainder of the grapes. And he said, even the gleaning of grapes from you guys is better than our vintage, even our first harvest. So you guys are really good. We're really bad. And see, you guys, you ca captured and killed two of the princes, two of them. And, and what did we do? So this calmed everybody down from Ephraim. So... Good for Gideon. Um, he has that patience to do that. Verse 4, When Gideon came to Jordan, he and 300 men who were with him crossed over, exhausted but still in pursuit. Then he said to, to the men of Sakoth, Please give loaves of bread to the people who follow me, so they are, for they are exhausted, and I am pursuing Ziba and Zalmunna, king of Midian. And the leaders of Sakoth said, are the hands of Ziba and Zamuna now in your hand that we should give bread to your army? So Gideon said, said, For this cause, when the Lord has delivered Ziba and Zamuna into my hand, then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. Then he went up from there to Penuel and spoke to them in the same way. And the men of Penuel answered him as the men of Sakoth and said, and it had answered. So he spoke to the men of Penuel saying, When I come back in peace, I will tear down this tower. So Gideon went to these guys saying, you know, my men are tired and we need food. And they said, we're not going to give you food because we don't know who's going to win. 
if we give you food and those guys win, then we're in trouble. So we're playing both sides. And Gideon just say, hey, when the Lord, and I like that. He says, when the Lord delivered them, when the Lord have, has victory, I'm going to come back. I'm going to remember what you guys did. And for us in life, we need to remember that it's not us who, who's fighting. It's God who's guiding us. We need to give God the glory. We need to have God in front of us. We don't want to get in front of God. I don't want to get in front of God. I used to because I was very impatient in life when I was younger, but now I, I feel I want to be behind the Lord and let him lead, right? And Gideon was, you know, this guy is pretty smart sometimes because in the end, we're going to see what else did he do. Um, verse 10, Now Ziba and Zamuna were at Kakor, and their armies with them, about 15,000. Remember, they had 135, right? They had 15,000 left. All who were left of all army of the people of the east. For 120,000 men who drew the sword had fallen. So 120,000 guys already died. So they had only 15,000 left. Verse 11. And remember, this is from 300 guys, right? And 300 still pursued. So that means none of them died. 300, and God protected these 300, which is pretty amazing. Verse 11, Then Gideon went up by the road of those who dwell in the tents of the east of Nor Noba and Jogbeha, and he attacked the army while the camp felt secure. Verse 12, And when Ziba and Zalmunna fled, he pursued them, and they took the two kings of Midian, Ziba and Zalmunna, and routed the whole army. That's 15,000 of them. Then verse 13, Then Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from the battle, from the ascent of Heres. Verse 14, And he caught a young man of the men of Sakkoth and interrogated him. And he wrote down for him the leaders of Sakkoth and his leader, and his elders, 77 men. And then he came to the men of Sakkoth and said, Here are Ziba and Zalmunna, about whom you ridicule me, saying, Are the hands of Ziba and Zalmunna now in your hand, that we should give bread to your weary men. Verse 16, And he took the elders of the city and thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them he taught the men of Sakkoth. He gave them a lesson. He taught them a lesson. He took cacti, sharp cacti, and he did something to these guys' bodies, so as he promised he would do. So some, you know, there are times when we have a choice of either following the Lord we're not following the Lord. When we follow the Lord, He's going to guide us through thick and thin. He'll guide us. When we don't follow the Lord, choose not to follow the Lord, He'll allow us to go. But it's going to be a hard road. And for the, it's, it's very hard. I mean, I don't even want to know what their flesh was like after, after these cacti. Um, it's it's the hard road. We don't want that. And even the, for the um, these other guys here, um, then he came to the oh, and he took the elders of the cities and and then then he went to uh, Peniel, tore down the tower and killed the men of the city. Hard road of not following the Lord. And verse 18, and he said to Ziba and Zamuna, what kind of men were they whom you killed at Tabor? So they answered, as you are, so were they. Each one resembled the son of a king. Then he said, they were my brothers, the sons of my mother. As the Lord lives, if he had let them live, I would not kill you. And he said to Jether, his firstborn, rise and kill them. But the youth would not draw his sword, for he was afraid, because he was still a young youth. I mean, just a kid, and he, he didn't tell him, oh, kill these guys, and he, this kid doesn't want to do it. So Ziba and Zamuna said, rise yourself and kill us, for as a man is, so is his strength. Hey, do it yourself, right? If you want to have us go, do it yourself. So Gideon rose and killed Z Ziba and Zamuna and took the crescent ornament uh, that were on their camel's necks. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, rule over us, both you and your son, and your grandson also, 
for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. You know, these guys wanted to have a dynasty. These guys want a man to rule over them. But Gideon was very wise. He said, it's not us. No way. It's God who's going to rule over you. And then Gideon said to them, I would like to make a request to you that each of you shall make, give me the earrings from his plunder. For they all had, all had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. So they answered, we will gladly give them. And they spread out a garment and each man threw into it the earrings from his plunder. Now the weight of the gold earring that he requested was 100, 1,700 shekels of gold besides the crescent ornaments, pendants, and purple robes that were on the kings of Midian and besides the chains that were on the camel's necks. 1,700 shekels is around 50 pounds and today's price is around $1.5 million. It's a lot of money. Uh, then Gideon made, made it into an ephod an ephod is actually was worn by the priest, and it was for divination. It was actually to see, seek the will of God. But it became a snare for these guys because people kind of made it where you know, they, they make it too important and almost worshiping it, so it became a snare. And so Gideon made it into an ephod and set it up in the city, Orpah. And all Israel played the harlot with it there. It became a snare to Gideon and to his house. Um, then Midian was subdued before the children of Israel so that they lifted their heads no more. And the country was quiet for 40 years in the days of Gideon. So Gideon was the judge over them for 40 years. And they had peace during that time. Verse 29, Then Jerubal, which is Gideon, the son of Joash, went to and dwelt in his own house. Gideon had, had 70 sons who were his own offspring, for he had many wives. So this is where the snare is. Back then, polygamy was okay. Never God's will, though. Because God created Adam, and he made Eve for Adam. It was always one man, one woman. It was always, I mean, that was God's plan. But man just sometimes just, you know, they decided to do his own thing. And Gideon, I mean, think about this. He had 70 sons. This is not even counting daughters. And it's, um, yeah, so that's, that's, um, that's the situation uh, at that time. And his concubine, uh, verse 31, who was in Shechem, also bore him a son whose name he called Abimelech. Abimelech, we're going to talk about next, next week, and it's going to be a snare. He did really evil, and we're going to talk about that um, next week. Now Gideon, the son of Joash, died at a good old age and was buried in the tomb of Joash, his father, in Orpah of the Abizrites. Verse 33, So it was, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel again played the harlot with the Baals and made Baal Beareth their god. As soon as Gideon was dead, they went back to their old ways. Like I said, it's, you know, sometimes we, we people do that. Humans do that. Not a good idea. And, you know, my, my prayer is all of us, we just walk with the Lord. Just walk with Him. It's the easier road. Doesn't mean you're not going to have tribulation, but it's a better road than to do what they did or to, to take another route. Um, thus the children of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hand of all their enemies on every side, nor did they show kindness to the house of Jerub, Jerubal, Gideon, in accordance with the good he had done for Israel. They totally forgot about what Gideon did, and, and they didn't treat his family well. So what are the key lessons here? The key, one key lesson is that we, we want to give God the glory. We don't want to give us the glory because God give us life. He holds our very breath. He deserves the glory. We always give Him the glory. We don't want to be doing things with fear and trembling. 
because those guys who left the first the, the first group of people, 22,000 people who left, they were fearful and trembling because they saw the 135,000 men. They saw their problems. And we, when you keep looking at your problems, you're not looking at God. And when we look at our problems, that problem, that fear grows, that problem gets bigger. But when we look at God, you know, and we just kind of, we, we just abide with the Lord, then all our problems will be smaller. The reason is God is that big. So we need to keep our eyes on the Lord and not keep our eyes on, on our problems. When you keep our eyes, your eyes on the problem, fear grows. When you keep your eyes on the Lord, your faith grows. Your fear goes down. And yeah, these guys were cyclical. As soon as a judge dies, they go back to their old ways. We, we need to keep our eyes on the Lord and abide with Him every day. So, yep, next week we're going to go over um, and see this kid, Abimelech, what he did. Not a good thing. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for today and thank you that we get the chance to, to study your word. May you just bless the people here, Lord. May you guide them. May you give them that wisdom to just walk with you all the time and to keep their eyes, our eyes, on you, not on our problems. Grow our faith, Lord, and help us to just trust you instead of trusting our own will. Thank you, Lord. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for coming.